The U.S. is a country of 50 states covering a vast swath of North America, with Alaska in the Northwest and Hawaii extending the nation's presence into the Pacific Ocean. And since its first habitation by indigenous populations, the land has been a gold mine, so to speak, of discovery. Even today, 20 shocking things recently discovered in the United States. Underground Inferno It's amazing how quickly things can change over a single lifetime. Just a century ago, the city of Centralia in Pennsylvania was a small town bustling with shops, residents, and a commercial mining business. Almost the entire local economy ran off fuel from the coal mines, and with only 1,200 residents in the town, everyone was close-knit with one another. But looking at the town today tells a completely different story. The streets are abandoned, and the buildings are long gone, replaced by graffiti stains on rubble. But what caused such a dramatic shift in such a short time? It's mostly a fire that's been burning underground for the past 50 plus years. Centralia is also known as the worst and most devastating underground fire in the United States' history. The mines were a foundation of life beforehand, established from the 1860s and even thrived post-World War II. It wasn't until a mysterious tragedy struck, although the origins for that tragic event still haven't become clear yet. Evidence seems to point towards the fire starting in a landfill that moved on to an abandoned mine pit. From there, the fire caught on to the coal seam below and spread further into tunnel territory. Attempts were made to put out the fire, but the inferno was too great and grew too quickly. The fire simply consumed everything in its wake. The houses and buildings lost their foundations, smoke poured out from any openings it could find, and the ground surface reached a staggering maximum heat of 900 degrees Fahrenheit, making the whole area essentially unlivable. It still burns today as one of the 38 known active mining fires in Pennsylvania alone. Hopefully one day it gets taken care of, but for now, it will remain an impossible dream. Fasten your seatbelts because it's time for today's sweet topic. What scientists just discovered at the Grand Canyon terrifies the whole world. Ancient carvings that would normally be found in places like Asia and the Middle East. But the truth is, ancient America was home to sophisticated civilizations such as the Maya, Inca, Olmec, and Aztec societies. So, what this image captured from Arizona's Grand Canyon suggests is that these ancient societies may have traveled more north than previously thought. They often carved into stone their deities associated with the powers of nature, rain, fertility, storms, rivers, mountains, oceans, earthquakes, and volcanoes were all associated with gods and goddesses. But uncovering such pristine examples of these artifacts in the United States proper is unheard of. Who are these mysterious figures cut right into the canyon's cliffs? And what else is the Grand Canyon concealing? It's 277 miles long, up to 18 miles wide, and attains a depth of over a mile. So finding even more ancient artifacts like this must be possible, right? Tell us what you think in the comments below using hashtag Sweet Topic. Growing on a tree. Have you ever walked past a public place and seen a bike hanging around without an owner? Sometimes people leave their bikes parked in some of the weirdest spots and you never know if they're actually going to return to pick it up. Most of the time you would expect to see a bike in a bike rack or maybe chained to a parking meter. But in front of a tree in the forest? It turns out that someone did actually leave a bike held up against a tree for so long that it eventually became a part of the environment itself. It happened in Vashon Island in Washington, but it's still a mystery what happened. Like, how did that small bike reach the center of the tree that high up and how long did it take for it to rise so high? But trees growing around bikes like this aren't the most uncommon thing to find. There's even been a recorded event of it happening to a motorcycle that was abandoned in the wild. One theory, which comes from an older folktale, is that this bike belonged to a boy who left it behind to join the war, where he tragically died as a hero. A second legend describes a story where the bicycle owner left behind his mode of transportation on the island forest and simply never came back again. Wherever the truth might lie, this special bike is currently a popular tourist spot as if it were some kind of art exhibit. Most people who attend to try to get pictures of it are just curious and wondering what exactly happened. Maybe one day they'll discover the true answer. Phone booth in the desert. 
In a time well before smartphones and wireless internet, phone booths were scattered all across the country. Mobile phones weren't even a concept yet, so when miners installed a phone booth in the middle of the Mojave Desert in the 60s, it wasn't as crazy as most people would think today. But when the climate changed and the miners all left, the phone booth remained as a reminder of the era left behind. Today it sits alone, miles away from the closest town. The booth is mostly in tatters, with broken glass from the windows being shot out and the overhead light being long gone. But surprisingly, nearly 30 years after its installation, in 1997 it did ring. It was a stranger with no affiliation, just some guy named Deuce that heard about the lonely booth and wanted to see if it was legit. So he called and it rang, and rang, and rang, and he called again until finally a random desert dweller answered. Her name was Loreen, and luckily she just happened to be walking past the area. Deuce wrote about the encounter for a blog on his website, which in turn led to others also calling the phone booth just to see if someone else would pick it up. And surprisingly enough, a few people did. For a brief time, the desert phone booth became a hot spot for tourists to stop by and answer calls from strangers just looking to say hi. A man from Texas even camped out for over a month and answered over 500 calls while he was there. It unfortunately is no longer in service. Too many visitors began to wear down the fragile land until it simply wasn't a viable resting spot. Smiley Face Forest as the seasons change from summer to fall, people start coming out to national parks for a chance to appreciate the autumn season. In one special spot in Oregon, even more people have arrived to find the Smiley Face Forest. It can be found deep in the rural Polk County. It really does look like a smiling face. The secret behind the smile is actually a set of trees that were planted to stand out and look like a bright and welcoming smile. The special forest came about in 2011 when Hampton Lumber planted a combination of Douglas fir and large trees in the middle of a reforestation project. Large trees were exclusively chosen because of their conifers turning yellow each fall, making them the perfect contrast and background for the emoji-like smiling tree formation along with the dark evergreen Douglas fir trees to provide the eyes and mouth. In total, the face reaches roughly 300 feet across and is presumed to stick around for locals and visitors alike to check out for at least another 30 to 50 years. If you ever see it in person, be sure to let us know if it put a smile on your face. Natural Cave Wonders Ever wondered what those spiky cone-shaped rocks sticking from the ceilings of caves are? Technically, they're known as speleothems, but they're also commonly known as stalactites or stalagmites. What's the difference, you might ask? We're not exactly sure, but someone with a PhD in geology could probably give you a good rundown. What we do know is that the Mammoth Cave National Park in Kentucky is full of these one-of-a-kind formations and some of them are definitely worth the visit. Depending on where you look will determine what type of rock formation you'll find. The wetter regions have plenty of these calcite-type formations that look like the standard stalagmite you might recognize, while the drier areas establish gypsum formations, a calcium sulfate mineral that's soluble in water. The gypsum formations are a bit nicer to look at, although they might give a bit of an eerie feeling knowing that they're purely natural. They often look like delicate white crystals that can sometimes take on the appearance of a stringy flower. If you go ahead and take a guided tour, Chances are a few of these will pop up along the way. In mammoth caves, however, most of them have been coated brown instead of their natural white state because of the constant soot that comes from the many torches that passed by. You'll have to go in a lot deeper if you want to find an unfiltered crystal, but be sure to take a flashlight instead of a flame. Mystery Rock Wall Whenever you see a wall of rocks, do you wonder how they ended up there? At the beach, it makes sense for the rocks to be pushed up from the bottom of the ocean to wherever the coastal waves take them. But then there's the East Bay Mysterious Rock Walls, also known as the Berkeley Mystery Walls. They make up a group of rocks fashioned into uneven sections of walls that stretch over a half mile long in the San Francisco Bay Area of California. Certain portions can reach up to a meter high and a meter wide, but for the most part, none of the rocks have a consistent size. Some sections are simply made out of piles of small rocks, while others are a single giant sandstone. It's not really known just how long these walls have been up, but the formations have lasted long enough to start sinking into the dirt holding them up. 
Different plants have even started growing over the rocks, proving that they don't seem to be all that recent or naturally made. So, what is their true purpose? The wall doesn't make a good fence since some sections are small enough to walk over and it definitely isn't tall enough to have been used as shelter during any ancient battles. No one even knows who exactly wanted it up in the first place. Maybe they were meant as an outgoing art project that's since been scrapped. There also are other similar crude walls that can be found in the surrounding hills, but this particular set seems to be the strangest. Maybe there's an even bigger mystery waiting to be uncovered here. But for now, no one seems willing to put forward an actual academic study on the spot. Worm Invasion One factor about the US that's worth keeping in the back of your mind is that there's a lot of biological diversity. What we mean is that you won't find the same species in the same areas. One in particular that's become a recent threat is the invasive bipallium, otherwise known as the hammerhead worm. It's a bit off-putting in both shape and color, but you can sort of see where it gets the hammerhead name from. But be warned, this is not a worm to trifle with. A Facebook post went viral not long ago claiming to be a part of the Texas Invasive Species Institute and featuring a picture of the disturbing worm. The post put out a warning not to touch the worm and definitely not to slice it up because this creature has the unique ability to multiply when chopped into pieces. Say you cut it straight down the middle, you won't be left with a worm split in half, but instead you'll quickly have two hammerhead flatworms to deal with. Not only that, but they seem to be multiplying even faster in North Texas for some reason. The scariest part might be that it looks just like any other worm you could find in your backyard on a rainy day. But unlike the native earthworms that feed and regurgitate helpful soil for plants, these hammerhead worms will instead eat the useful earthworms. In a way, you can think of them as the harmful weeds plaguing your vegetable garden. After the post made headlines, people throughout Texas started posting about their own worm discoveries. They've been advised to either spray them with citrus oil and vinegar or to freeze them in a tightly sealed bag. Lost Sphinx in California Other than the ancient pyramids, Egypt is also known for having a colossal Sphinx statue hiding away in their harsh deserts. But did you know that there's another desert that's been hiding a sphinx all this time? Or at least its head. In California, on the set of Cecil B. DeMille's 1923 Hollywood hit, The Ten Commandments, a 300-pound sphinx head was discovered in the dunes of Santa Barbara County. The film was intended to be an epic retelling of the story of Moses from the Bible. It was a silent black-and-white era film that was shot in the Guadalupe Nupomo dunes, hoping to mimic the landscape of Egypt. To make it just right, DeMille led an excavation that stretched 12 stories high and 800 feet wide. At the time, it was by far the largest film set ever to be made, and it featured a colossal gate, some fake statues of pharaohs, and notably, 21 sphinxes made out of plaster and shipped from Paris. It took over 1,300 craftsmen to put it all together. But once the film was finished, DeMille asked for everyone to bury their set into the dunes. No reason was asked why, and DeMille never brought it up again to explain himself. One theory was that their budget had run out, and they didn't have enough time or money to dismantle the whole project. Another reason could have been that DeMille didn't want anyone else to use his custom pieces for one of their own projects. He really wanted to keep his film unique. But regardless of the reason, the set did turn up again and Hollywood relics were found once more. Unfortunately, though, they crumbled in an attempt to free them from the sand. The Casa Grande Ruins The Hohokam was a culture of people that flourished in the south-central region of modern-day Arizona. They centered most of their community around some impressively large adobe structures, but without any traces or hints at an explanation. They all seemingly abandoned their region in 1450 CE. Today, the Casa Grande Ruins National Monument is held up to preserve the ancient farming community of the former Hohokam people. The ruins that were left behind make up multiple structures all around by a sturdy wall meant to protect the local people from invasions and secure their crops. The original records of Casa Grande were left behind in 1694. People didn't really begin to travel to the abandoned fields until train travel was more common though, around the 1860s to the 1880s. But instead of embracing the lost heritage, what happens to most abandoned American towns also occurred here. Graffiti 
vandalism, and all types of souvenir hunting or grave robbing took place. An archaeological reserve was set up to try and protect the small town from further destruction. And in 1892, the Casa Grande ruins were designated as the first archaeological reserve in the U.S. By 1918, it even became a national monument. That being said, the reserve is more of a protection over a historical site. There isn't a whole lot to do there if you're looking for a day of fun and entertainment, but if learning history is your thing, you probably won't want to miss it. Abandoned Oklahoma Town If you're making your way through the United States and you happen to reach Oklahoma's Ottawa County, you might stumble across the most northeastern incorporated city. It sits right at the edge of the city limits connecting to the Kansas state line but you'll have to decide if it's worth staying or leaving. Pitcher was once the most productive mining field in the tri-state lead and zinc district that was comprised of Oklahoma, Kansas, and Missouri. At one point, it produced over $20 billion worth of ore during its run from 1917 to 1947. In fact, over half the lead and zinc metals used in World War I came directly from the Pitcher field. But with so much mining and so many hazardous materials, it's no wonder that the local people started complaining about health issues. The water that was pulled from underground was tainted by all of the lead pumping, and in 1983, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency had to step in and try and clean up the mess. It wasn't until 2008 and the EPA finally managed to clean up most of the site, costing over $160 million in the process. But by the time the town was finally livable again, Disaster struck once more, this time in the form of an F4 tornado. Six people didn't survive the natural disaster, and over 150 others were badly injured. In 2009, the town decided to close up for good. Strange Souvenir at the Airport Here's a bit of a strange and gruesome tale. Airport security loves to stress that if you see something strange, you should definitely report it. You never know what you might find at a terminal of travelers from anywhere around the world but this particular package probably isn't what you think it is. At the Detroit Metropolitan Airport in Michigan, U.S. Customs and Border Specialists discovered a young dolphin skull left behind in some unaccompanied luggage. Authorities looked into the situation and said that the bag was separated from its owners during their transit overseas, but it did successfully make its way through a routine screening and x-ray. Also, in case you were wondering, Possessing a dolphin skull isn't actually legal in the United States, or at least this one wasn't. There are many wildlife restrictions on imports and exports, specifically targeting birds and marine mammals, like the dolphin in question. But another question is, who left behind these animal bones, and what were they planning on doing with them? Authorities might have the answers by now, but they're not sharing any confidential information. They turned the dolphin skull over to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for a proper investigation and will wait for their answers first. Leftover Presidents The presidents of the United States are more than just figureheads to the powerful country, but if you were to travel to Croker in Virginia, you might actually find some literal presidential figureheads. These giant aging busts were sculpted for the Open Air Museum in President's Park from Williamsburg. But things didn't quite work out and the park closed down permanently just a few years after its grand opening. A man named Howard Hankins didn't want the 43 sculptures to go to waste and commissioned them to be replaced and moved over to where they sit today. The busts average out to be around 20 feet tall and weighed around 20,000 pounds each. What's more, it cost over $50,000 to get them moved, but the cost was a bit steeper than what money could afford as more than a few of them were damaged in the process. You still can visit the statues today and see their crumbling pieces before they all start to fade away from existence. But if things go well and a new presidential park is opened, Hankins plans to move them back for display. There will probably need to be some remodeling and a few other extra costs, not to mention the travel expense of shipping them out again. But hopefully they'll still get the chance to see light again. Bishop's Castle There aren't a whole lot of castles in the North American region. There are plenty of geographical reasons and even more cultural explanations for why that is, but that isn't to say that there aren't any castles at all. In Colorado, there might just be the most famous of all the American castles, and it was built by Jim Bishop in 1969. Bishop set up shop in the city of Rye, with no blueprints or diagrams to follow for instructions. It took about 60 years to complete, but the design is a pure monument to his own imagination and casual approach to construction. He reportedly told one interviewer, 
I just build. I don't measure. When Bishop started the infamous Bishop Castle, it was originally just a one-room cottage. Now, it's a fully structured tower of teetering bridges and stairs, along with plenty of signs asking visitors not to shake or jump. Because, well, Bishop didn't believe in building codes or standardized safety measures. Bishop started his climb to Castledom when he was just 15, by mowing lawns and delivering newspapers. He raised just enough to buy the piece of land he craved, but his parents had to handle the paperwork because he was too young at the time. He then learned how to build and forge and fix everything that he needed to live on his own, with some help from his dad, until the inspiration to build a castle struck him. At that point, his dad decided it was too much work and backed out, but the young bishop wouldn't let his dream die, and evidence of that willpower is still visible today, if you're willing to make the trip. Judah Color Rock you can scale the mountains of this country for miles, hundreds of miles even, and maybe more, and you still won't find every secret hidden among the rocky walls. But the mountains of North Carolina have some pretty obvious ancient stories carved into them, with one in particular about the giant named Judah Culler. His story can be seen on a popular hiking area that's called the Devil's Courthouse today. It's a tale from the Cherokee's lore and goes back over a thousand years in history. The main focus, Judah Culler, was a guard over the hunting grounds below. He sat high above in the mountains in a spot called his judgment seat. The legend then goes on to say that a group of hunters had wandered into his territory despite his warnings and increasing demands to leave. It got to the point that the giant had to leap down from his mountain to finally chase them away. But when he landed, his larger-than-life hand sunk into a soapstone boulder. That same boulder is still around to check out and it's called Juddakulla's Rock. It's a seven-finger handprint in a single corner of the rock, but there are also some ancient petroglyphs alongside it. Historians have used this evidence to say that the Cherokee tribes likely carved the glyphs around 500 AD. It's all a bit mysterious in an intriguing way, but there's plenty of other marks of Judah color to check out as well. The Nevada Shoe Tree We've seen a bike tree, but in Middle Gate of Nevada, it looks like there's an even weirder shoe tree out there. It sits along the Highway 50 and against a barren desert with mountains in view. It's a cottonwood tree, and if you didn't know any better, you might think it produces sneakers instead of fruit. The origin of this backdrop started when a newlywed camping couple argued nearby. The woman threatened to walk away while husband warned her that she'd have to walk barefoot. He then took her shoes and threw them up into the tree before driving off to a bar nearby. It took some convincing of the bartender before he decided to head back where his wife remained still barefoot. According to the story, they came back a few years later with their first kid and tossed his shoes up there as well. Now, whether this is a true tale or a local story for fun, plenty of people have decided to uphold the tradition and toss their shoes up as well. They even give off a dazzling look in the wintertime when the background is covered in desert frost, or at least they did until 2010 when the tree was cut down by vandals. But hope wasn't lost and in 2017, a new tree was designated as a replacement shoe tree by the locals. It should still be up, waiting for more people to give up their shoes. Time Travel Mart How much would you pay to go back to the past and buy that one thing you just can't get anymore? Follow-up question How much would you pay to buy something from the future? While you can't exactly get what you're hoping for, there's a fun spot in Los Angeles called the Time Travel Mart that lets you enjoy the idea. The store features a list of historical items for purchase, such as mammoth chunks to robot milk, but it also serves as a great educational tool for students trying to learn about history. The idea behind the Mart started as a plan to convince kids that learning can be cool. 826 LA is the local chapter of a national organization that wants to encourage free student learning and educational tools. But once they claimed their location, zoning laws got in the way of their services being free. They were forced to set up a retail establishment, so they made the executive decision to make it as interesting and informational as they could. Outside of learning, though, there are plenty of reasons to check out the store and even make a few purchases. All funds are transferred over to their schooling supplies and needs, and most people working are volunteers that aim to help the children that benefit from the organization. But really, where else can you go to get a Victorian iPod? Better stock up while you can. The future is almost here. Hole in the Wall Theater 
peepholes aren't generally considered to be a good thing to find and especially not to use, but that all adds to the charm of this specialized peephole cinema. It's hidden in an alley deep in the heart of the Mission District of San Francisco, and when we say hidden, we mean that it's literally a hole in the wall. If you peek into the small hole, you'll be able to catch whatever silent film is playing at that moment. It's a great blast to the past from generations long before any of our own, unless you're an 80-year-old walking around random alleyways. But aside from being a small and inconspicuous hole, you'll also have to crouch down or stretch your neck out in order to actually see through it. If you do, you'll be treated to plenty of short films on an endless loop that play all day and all night. You could technically stop by whenever you want. The only drawback is that you'll probably have to be told about it before you go and try to find it on your own. Surely someone must have walked by and decided to stick their eye up against a random wall though, right? There's a list of films that are shown right below the peephole, but it isn't the most noticeable thing if you aren't looking for it already. Aside from that, there aren't any other signposts or any indicators of what you should be doing. So now that you know, what are you waiting for? A sweet graveyard. When someone dies, there's a commemorative task to honor their death with a funeral or maybe a tombstone burial. But when it's a product that's no longer for sale, usually it's just a metaphor. The product wasn't actually alive, so how can it be dead? Just ask Ben and Jerry, but only after you check their ice cream flavor, Graveyard. Ben Cohen and Jerry Greenfield are the masterminds behind the iconic Ben and Jerry's ice cream shop and mass-marketed ice cream pints. They first opened their shop in 1978 and have since experimented with a delightful catalog of flavors that have withstood the tests of time, or most of them at least. For every flavor that's been removed from their limited edition status or simply taken off the market, there's a special place in Waterbury, Vermont where you can pay your respects. It's a literal flavor graveyard. The idea started off as a web page that kept track of each flavor you could no longer buy in stores. But somewhere along the way, that idea grew until real tombstones were made and a new tourist attraction was born. Among the headstones are something like 300 different discontinued treats. They each even get their own poem dedicated to what could have been if the flavor was better appreciated. It started back in 1997, when there were only four flavors to lay to rest. It was the Dastardly Mash, Economic Crunch, Ethan Almond, and Tuskegee Chunk. Since then, there have been a lot of interesting additions, including O Pear and Sugar Plum. But just because one flavor is dead doesn't necessarily mean it's gone for good. An online poll was started by the company to bring back a special flavor, so there's still hope. The Michigan Mammoth Everyone's always looking for dinosaur bones out in the wild, but this Michigan farmer came across a completely different type of animal. The farmer was James Bristle, and along with his neighbor, the two were trying to dig a trench for their drainage pipe in that wheat field. But suddenly, Bristle's hoe hit something eight feet below ground, where there should have only been dirt. It didn't take long before they both realized that they had stumbled upon something massive. It was a three-foot-long woolly mammoth bone. Bristle later told reporters, we didn't know what it was, but we knew it was certainly a lot bigger than a cow bone. His next guess was that it could have been a dinosaur bone, so he contacted the University of Michigan's Museum of Paleontology and set out to have it studied. A team of researchers quickly came out to investigate, but Bristle gave them a hard deadline of just a single day to dig because harvest season was quickly approaching and that drain pipe still wasn't installed. But they managed to meet their deadline and excavated around 20% of the mammoth's bones. It was an amazing find considering that only five other examples have been claimed in such great condition. Bristle donated the find to the museum, claiming that it should belong to everyone. He said a lot of people will benefit from being able to see this mammoth for many years to come. If I can make people happy about doing it, then I consider that a good day. Classic Film Vault Unless you've experienced firsthand just how big the United States is, you might not realize just how far apart each state is. The distance from Hollywood to Kansas City, for instance, is roughly 1,600 miles, or around 2,600 kilometers. That's more than triple the amount of distance from Spain to France, and yet it barely covers the halfway point before moving on to the rest of the United States. So, when we say there's a Hollywood trove hiding out of sight and just below Kansas City, it might be a bit hard to believe. But it's true. 
Just 160 feet below ground is a warehouse where thousands on thousands of Hollywood film movies are lined up in old school canisters along these shelf walls. The collection belongs to the underground vaults and storage facility and they have all the classics from Gone to the Wind to Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, although the manager won't reveal what else is hiding down there. Some movie companies don't want others to know that they've stashed copies of certain media in such a publicly known place, so they keep the list on a need-to-know basis. But according to the manager of the warehouse, Brian Corwin, there are other hidden storages with their own classic movie collections as well. A lot of the companies keep them separated in case of an earthquake or some other natural disaster. But Corwin went on to mention that he's got at least a hundred years worth of content stored in his warehouse alone. At least he'll never run out of anything to watch. So if you aren't spooked out by some of these shocking discoveries, would you still want to come and see what else the United States has to offer? There are a lot more mysteries than what we've covered here, but we like to hope that we've given a bit of insight to the unusual and mystifying treats of the massive country.